Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, especially happy today to open this uh, chat about Canto 33 of Dante's Paradiso for many, many reasons. Number one reason is because I have Dan Christian on the line, um, uh, the friend of this series and my friend who's been uh, supporting this project and uh, chatting with me already a couple of times before about uh, this uh, little light book, right? That's called The Divine Comedy, Dan. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he has um, long-standing experience in uh, in teaching Dante and teaching a divine comedy to different students, uh, then you're uh, you're you live in Iowa as of today. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit of uh, your background in the description box of of this video. So, but uh, Dante has always been uh, pretty central in your life, hasn't he? It has been. Yeah. I mean, pretty much since uh, <clears throat> back in uh, since 1981. Uh, so that's a pretty, that's a pretty long time. And so this, this is a real, um, I mean, frankly, Tom, I mean, what you have created here is, seems to me, for, is exactly what Dante would have hoped people would have been doing with his story, you know? I mean, very targeted and specific and thoughtful um, conversations about this living, breathing poem that he had created. So I'm pretty sure right now, um, not only are people that, you know, I'm honored to be a part of it and people that have tuned in, uh, but I'm pretty sure Dante right now is applauding very loudly uh, on behalf of your efforts. So. That, would, that would make me so happy if he was. I'm, um, I'm hoping that's, the, that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, a big part of what his work has generated through all the centuries, the seven centuries, is to make people reflect to make people like us have a dialogue and discuss about uh, our life our our whole life and uh, not only not only under the christian standpoint so i wanted to start uh, today's video and chat with uh, uh, a little bit of a request or maybe a, a, a wish for whoever is watching the video and whoever has been following all these uh, 100 videos about uh, the divine comedy I'm, I'm saying that and it sounds like crazy in my head, just, just saying that, but uh, it's been such a pleasure. I would like to ask uh, the, the viewers, if you have the patience to write maybe something like a brief one line or two lines about uh, what reading a divine comedy has meant to you and to your life. It could be, it could be even something as simple as, you know, you opened up, I maybe, I am not religious, I'm not Christian, but reading the Divine Comedy, let me understand a little bit more or maybe more deeply the, the Christian point of view. Or maybe from the historic point of view, I understood that Middle Age period of time better thanks to my, my reading of the Divine Comedy. Or even more personal, you know, because I started in my very first introduction video saying, for me, I honestly think, even if it's such a cliche, that this book changed my life. It really did. It changed it, meaning that it encouraged me to develop so much, encouraged me to be the best version of myself um, in a way that the Bible also does. And I'm Catholic, so, you know, I, I follow that. But uh, in a special, very specific way and very entertaining at the same time. Yes. So um, that's my, you know, and so I said, the Divine Comedy has been an X-ray the first time that I actually read it for for my interior side and my, my, my soul. Um, it would be nice to to hear what, what the Divine Comedy has represented for people who are listening. And, uh, and let me turn this question to you then, Dan. Let, let's start with that. Um, yeah, I, let me just go back just quickly. I mean, I, I love what you just said, Tom, because the, the idea that the that the story, the divine comedy has functioned as a kind of x-ray for you. And that um, to keep that sort of healing, almost surgical, you know, metaphor, um, you know, the few times that I've had to be in an operating room, um, people had to take x-rays and then I'm put into this room 
that I am wrapped in a blanket and I am confronted with an unbelievable intensity of light. And so the idea that the divine comedy is, is not only an x-ray, it's a kind of psycho-spiritual surgical procedure. Oh my, 100%. Um, yeah, I think I really kind of like the idea of thinking about the fact that he's, so I love that idea that about it being an x-ray. I hadn't even never really thought about that image before, but it, it does, right? I mean, it exposes, catches you in the act of looking at your insides in a way that um that is not always comfortable that's not always really comfortable <laughs> particularly when they find a little oh yeah you see that thing in there we're gonna have to take that out <laughs> you know and so, so anyway that's a wonderful that's a wonderful yeah. image so yeah yeah um so and so you, you feel you feel like uh for you i mean i think for you as an educator and a teacher it's uh you know even more I, I guess you have two points of view one on you personally on you as an individual and then the other one on all the students that you've been teaching and uh, and the impact that you've seen with your eyes um that the divine comedy made on on them right oh no absolutely i mean i've been you know that was a you know the cool thing about getting a chance to be in a formal classroom back with this you know when i was a high school teacher and now and these schools, you know, over Zoom that I've been doing has been that it is very much, well, it's very much like I've been lucky enough to get a chance to do with you. It's like we are playing a catch with Dante's story. And we are, it is a mutual experience. It's not a, some kind of sage on the stage that's telling you all the answers and we're just listening, but we are engaged in a, a back and forth process of, in which, the end result, I think, is that the the poem gets bigger and brighter because of that. Absolutely, yeah. It it's fully interactive. It's fully interactive. You, yes. you, you, you're not a passive spectator. You are right there. You're right there, walking up with uh, Dante and Virgil, and then with Dante and Beatrice, and then with San Bernard. Uh, you know, as as long as we understand something of what San Bernard is saying, because these last cantos are probably the most, the most complex, right, of all the entire work. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, and would you mind, or can I, if, since, since we have, we have time here, can I ask you a question? Because something that came up to me, absolutely. or came up in my mind, it, well, lots of questions, actually. It's just not like, you know, I only have two or three. I, it <laughs> seems like I have more and more, and every time I talk about it, I, uh, I am, at peace with the the grappling but i still have more questions you know <laughs> it just it just keeps building on itself but i was just kind of curious about what you think about the so dante has essentially had three guides right he's had virgil he's had you know beatrice sorry to butcher her name no there. good pronunciation uh, i did my best there um and then he's had saint bernard that kind of you know wraps it up and I was thinking about when I was getting set up here to talk with you, I was wondering that I was wanting to really ask you this. And I have a few other things I'd actually like to ask you as well about this canto. But um, the, the way in which the departure scenes, when Dante has left guide number one, left guide number two, uh, has been interesting, right? I mean, there's a um that Virgil delivers his final words to Dante there's no real formal goodbye um and then Virgil sticks around and you know they make eye contact once again because they're looking at the pageant coming in and then all of a sudden he turns around bingo Virgil's gone Beatrice's departure is you know she's essentially predicting the future right about the you know, Boniface or the next Pope that's going to be driving Boniface deeper into, into the hole. <laughs> and, uh, and then he sees her again when he thanks her when she's up in her seat and she smiles at him and then looks back at the eternal fountain. So there's no real formal, you know, goodbye there. And I was yeah. curious about what you think. I think it's in line 49. I have my text here. The last reference to Bernard is he says, the poet Dante says, Bernard was signaling, 
he smiled to me to turn my eyes on high, but I had already, uh, I already was doing what he'd wanted me to do. So he was kind of, the, the guide was inviting him to do something that he'd already, like Dante has become a pretty good student, right? He, he seems to be uh, doing what the teacher had hoped he was doing kind of on his own. So what do you make of the, the ways in which the guides have left? Uh, I, I love this question. Thanks, uh, Dan, for that. Um, so let me read this third set in Italian, okay? Because I want to make the Italian kind of sound out of this video as well. Thank you. It's uh, uh, line 49. Bernardo macennava e sorridea per chi guardassi suso, ma io era già per me stesso tal qual e volea. Beautiful. And uh, in uh, the way that I take it the way I understand it, especially in relation to the other two goodbye scenes, uh, as, as you say, is uh, that uh, it, it makes so much sense that there is no formalized goodbye ceremony or procedure in both cases with Virgil and Beatrice, because as a poet, it's, it's obvious that Dante feels uh, like he loves Virgil almost almost even more than an actual friend because right. that's how much he, he he's lived all of his life inside books inside poetry and he knows the NA by heart you know um he feels so close and in fact when you have so much written text by somebody by an author you you get the impression that you start really really knowing what you know so the, the personality of this person, just like we do with Dante, because this work is so long, we we understand him, we understand him as, as a person, and so we can feel that, that connection. And uh, because of this reason, because of how genuine his his uh, feelings of love and friendships uh, friendship are, I think he prefers to not have something of a formalized goodbye to make us experience that emotion even more strongly in a more vivid way um oh. you know he's he's turning around and he's the character himself is surprised so that kind of surprise if we think about in our life the moments when we lost somebody not because necessarily they were they died but because we lost them you know the relationships break etc it you know the the more sudden and the more unexpected and, and not formalized they are, the, the more intense the feelings are and, uh, and it jumps out more at us, right? Uh, that's, I mean, that, that's, that's wonderfully thoughtful and helpful and, um, and, and, and makes all kinds of sense to me. There, there's a, I don't know if we had talked about this before, there's a book by a man named Sheldon Van Auken who was a student and then subsequently became a friend of C.S. Lewis's. And the book's called A Severe Mercy. And it has 18 previously unpublished letters by C.S. Lewis. And it's in one of those letters where I first, since I didn't know any Italian when I first read Lewis Observed, um, I, and it's free of Paradiso. And I'm not going to pronounce it very well, so again, I apologize. But it's Poesi alle Tona Fontana. And, and, she, and she looked to the eternal fountain. Okay. And I didn't know what that meant. I just thought Lewis was just sort of dropping in foreign phrases in some sort of scholarly way. And then I read, in, when I read that book, a, a, um, a Severe Mercy, in one of the letters that Lewis was writing to Sheldon Van Auken, he told Van Auken, hey, you better read the Paradiso, hadn't you? Um, that note the moment when Beatrice looks to the eternal fountain and Dante is 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 fine with her looking away, and I just thought it was really cool. It's like Lewis actually answered my own question about the last line. But one of the cool lines, and again, not being a Christian myself, and I know that you are, but he said he shouted to Van Auken once when they were crossing a street in Oxford, and it was kind of sentimental. But there's some theological juice to it, I think. <laughs> he, uh, Ben Auken said goodbye to Lewis and Lewis yelled across the road and said, Christians never say goodbye. <laughs> and so even obviously Virgil was not a Christian, but he certainly, he had some, uh, 
John the Baptist characteristics, you know, uh, a little bit, and um, just born a few years too early. But maybe Christians never really say goodbye because there's 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 more to come. That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I mean, um, if nothing else, because there is just one meeting point for for all, for all of us. Um, that's kind of the concept that Christianity has in common with other large religions. Um, and that's where Canto 33 uh, also can be seen as very universal. In this canto, and in this last canto, San Bernard, uh, they, they don't lose time with technicalities. It's, it's about humanity and divinity. And, Beautiful uh, said, well said. And how you, how you make sense of, of that, how of, of that concept. So, and to finish answering the, your question, the third moment is this one, like you uh, properly, you know, highlighted, it's another in sort of goodbye, because obviously we don't know what happens after this moment in the Divine Comedy. This is the end of the book, but uh, it's clear that Dante is not going to speak to San Bernard anymore after, right. after this moment. So, you, you pointed out the, the, the difference. The difference is that we understand that Dante has finally made it, has finally understood what the right type of mental approach and uh, soul approach is to, to contemplation. Um, first, he was all distracted by his own love for Virgil and also by the directions that Virgil was giving him they very often we're wrong from <laughs> directions. Virgil is so <laughs> endearing when he when he keeps making mistakes. Um, Beatrice, she doesn't really make mistakes, um, but uh, whenever you know, a couple of times, a few times, Dante is so taken with her beauty and with his love for her that he forgets what's most important. It was most important. He forgets that he shouldn't be focusing on her beauty. The beauty that she has comes from God. Right. And here in this third set, line 49, he, he has finally, for the first time, got it. He's finally understood it. And, and instead of uh, looking at San Bernard like he would have done until here, not before, he has the strength to ignore San Bernard and to go directly to the right. source, to the source of everything. Um, so there is a lot to try to understand. Obviously, I'm not saying I do, but you know, there's a lot to unpack and try to um, articulate out, out of only these three lines, okay? So this is the challenge that we have today, Dan, to <laughs> try and unpack uh, the, the entire canto, if we, if we can, as, as much as possible. Yep. Um, so since we mentioned his love for Beatrice, something else that... Uh, I want to highlight, and maybe I haven't uh, highlighted enough in this series, is uh, in history, and we get this uh, clearly from the Vita Nuova, the new life that Dante wrote uh, when he was younger. Um, Dante in Florence must have been a little bit of a bizarre individual. Bizarre meaning uncommon. I, I, I'm sure 100% that people in Florence who knew him which, is, which was everybody, because everyone knew everyone in, uh, right. in Florence, um, knew that he was an uncommon, an uncommon type, somebody different. And part of his difference was also in his uh, uh, particular, let's call it emotional um, situation that, that he, they say that he had epilepsy and so he suffered from a little bit of a health uh, condition. Wow. But, in particular, it seems like almost everyone, including his wife, before he married her, knew about his love for Beatrice. The, you know, oh, that's the guy who has a crush on Beatrice. Right. So this was a little bit of a story, you know, and uh, this is why in the, in the Vita Nuova, in the New Life, there is a scene where there is a group of women who mock him and laugh at him because in a party, he is uh, having a, you know, one of his, uh, oh my God, he's almost <laughs> fainting because he's seeing Beatrice. He's <laughs> leaning on the wall and looks up and obviously people are laughing at him because it's not normal, it's not common, right? right? 
So this, he was the guy who was in love with Beatrice. And uh, there is a, an understanding, even if we're not sure, that people found Gemma Donati, who became his wife, almost as a way to, to help him, to help him out of the misery that he had fallen into after Beatrice had died. You know, wow. um, it, 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 it would all fit in the, let's say, uh, stru structure and in the frame of what we know about Dante from the Divine Comedy and, and his writings. The fact that he was no um, common individual at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I consider him a miracle. One of those, one of those people who are, you know, God sent, let's say, uh, yes. for some higher purpose. And so how do we reconcile that with the fact that uh, in the Divine Comedy, it sounds like he knows that he was God sent and that uh, he's got this kind of uh, sense of pride, which he's very self-aware, is aware of to the point that, uh, and it's fine here if we jump around because <clears throat> the canto does not really necessarily follow, it doesn't need to be followed um, chronologically, but towards uh, the, the final part, as soon as he, you know, starts the, the elevation of his gaze into, into God's gaze, at a certain point, uh, at line 76, he says, uh, Io credo per la cume che io soffersi del vivo raggio, che io sarei smarrito se gli occhi miei da lui fossero aversi. And this is a, um, a reference to the fact that he is not sure that he can make it. He's not sure that he can actually make it. Um, mm -hmm. in a, he's, a, he's aware of his weakness and he's, he's brought his own uh, human baggage, let's say, even to this point, which is the highest possible. Um, I, I find it interesting because he's not acting as if he was fully purified and fully a perfect um, soul at this point. He is aware of his weakness and uh, it's almost a uh, humility that he's yes. able to show in, in this moment. Do, do you agree? No, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and he even um, uses the same word. Um, I'm going to mispronounce it again, but it's at the uh, the last line of, of line 70, the last word of line 77, Samarito, is the same word he used in Infernal One um, when that's he was right. talking about getting that, that, uh, being lost. That's such an excellent point. I didn't even connect those, uh, those dots. That's, that's such an excellent point. Smarito, as lost or uh, uh, completely confused. Um, because in that moment, the the light is so bright and shiny that he's afraid that, that he cannot even, even look into it. But um, um, so, <clears throat> so then what do you make of this, uh, of this initial um, invocation to Mary? We know that the invocation to Mary, Virginia Madre, is a, um, a prayer that uh, Sir Bernard um, um, is, is reaching out to Mary and asking her for the grace to allow Dante yes. uh, to meet with the divine as much as possible. And uh, from, the point of, from, from my point of view of a religious person, I almost feel the same reading this uh, initial 40 lines as when I say my Hail Marys, you know, if I'm in church and say a Hail Mary, it really has the same power because um, it's written on the blueprint of, of the Hail Mary, only with, I, I would dare to say, more poetic articulation than, than the original, if, if I dare say that. Um, what, but what do you make of this from the non-religious standpoint? What, what hits you? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I, it's amazing too, because I didn't even make the connection in my head that it's sort of structured on, it's sort of a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's Bernard's version, of, and he was a big Mary person anyway, right? Saint Bernard. Yes. Um, that it's a, it's the Hail Mary um, that's that's not generic, but it's very targeted. Exactly. 
um, and not being, um, you know, a, a, a Christian, but what I did, what I do appreciate, did and I did and do and will continue to appreciate that the um, the prayer is, um, well, number one, he's, it appears to me, and correct me if you think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm off base here, it appears that Bernard recognizes that in order for what he's seeking from her is that he's praying to her so that she can pray to God. Yes. Um, so it's not, because lots of times I've heard people um, make this criticism of Catholicism that they worship Mary. Um, and A, not true. It's never been true. Um, yeah. And even here, I'm trying to think if I can see in the line, he says, um, line 28, uh, and I, who have never burned for my own vision more, I'm reading Alan Mandelbaum's translation, than I burn for his, do offer you all of my prayers and pray that they may not fall short, that with your prayers, you may disperse all of the clouds of his mortality. Um, yes. And so I really find it that Bernard does not slip into an idolatrous relationship with Mary here, that it's a, it's a genuine, almost communion of saints appeal, because even Bernard, Bernard says to Mary, hey, look, Beatrice and all these other saints have their hands together, and they're, they're, they're joining me here. I mean, there, there's a little bit of a let's gang up on Mary moment here. Um, it's, a, it's a very powerful prayer, very powerful it, it, prayer. That it really is. An, an offer that cannot be refused, right? That's um, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Um, yes, um, I, I like that you highlight this because, um, like, like you mentioned, San Bernard, we, we owe him a lot of the Marian theology. And, yep. uh, you know, as you dig deeper into what that means, St. Bernard wrote a lot of theological texts that are still used today for, for that purpose, to study, they call it Mariology, I think, you know, it's a whole discipline. But the point is that she's not a divinity. Mary is a woman. Mary is a woman. And uh, as much of, as a symbol, that you know, Christianity has built around her. She is a human being. She is a, a woman, and uh, given that proximity of mother and son in the womb, uh, that's why she is the closest human being to God. Uh, th that's kind of the logical explanation, and and that's where I can get to with my logic. <laughs> so this is still a territory where I still feel like comfortable enough to speak, you know, and, and ex explain. The more we proceed in this canto, the less confident I'm going to be in, uh, <laughs> in really explaining because, I mean, you know what strikes me about this canto then? That I was rereading it yesterday, and when I got to the end, something that really, really hit me was the control that Dante has. Despite the immense emotional intensity mm -hmm. this is um i don't know if you like beethoven a little bit but i think about uh, some of his symphonies and, and some of them in particular the, the sixth the pastoral ends with uh, a glorious triumphal type of conclusion and you know this is a glorious and triumphal conclusion so all of his emotions are at 110 percent here right, right. you can feel it but at the same time when it would be so easy for a lesser poet to get out of the rails or maybe sound even hysterical because of how yeah. strong these feelings are, Dante is in complete control, yeah. complete control. And I'm saying that because the, the structure that he's following, every tercet has, a, has a, a, a place and a meaning. And that means that He's one of the greatest poets who ever lived. I, I, I think th that's what I'm trying to express, you know? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's very interesting. I, I'll have to think more about that because I would like to think that, I would like to think in general, and perhaps Dante 
is, if not necessarily agreeing with this, that, that he's, he, his story is at least bearing witness to the possibility of this, that, um, that an ecstatic experience does not have to mean that you have lost your reason. Exactly. That's they, thank they you. For you said it. Exactly. One hundred percent. We yeah. we as Christians as well, we don't dismiss reason. The fact that Virgil is not with us anymore. No, he's still here. Everything, all the work that Dante has done with Virgil is extremely valid, is still all here. And uh, it's just that, you know what I like? Uh, I don't remember which theologian. He says that Christianity speaks at a level that is not um, below rationality. There is not sub, sub or sub rational because under rationality, you have irrationality and superstition. So worshiping Mary, worshiping, you know, idolatry, that would be irrational superstition, right? But it's supra rational, meaning beyond rationality, there is something that Christianity believes us human beings can reach and can achieve. Um, of course, you have to have faith to believe that because I'm, you know, I know that there are people who think that rationality it is pure, in its purest form is the best that we can do as, as human beings. But, uh, but this worldview, if we want to call it, says differently. It says that we can do better and, and right. above what rationality can do. Yeah, there's a great line in the first film version of the relationship between C.S. Lewis and Joy Davidman came out um, in 1987. C.S. Lewis says to um, Joy Davidman, after he meets, um, that one of the purposes of reason is to help us realize that reason is not enough. Uh, I, lo I love it. I love it. And so I, that seems to sort of echo a little bit of what, of what you were saying about super rational and... Um, well, uh, because we... We live in a world today that does not agree with that very much. Uh, I think in, in terms of uh, our mainstream culture. Um, so, and Dante lived in a world that did <laughs> agree yes. with that. And the fact that, um, you know, what we do is to make this false analogy between science and say, oh, you know what? The science of Dante's time was wrong compared to today's science. Therefore, the religion of those times right. must have been wrong as well. Right. It's a false analogy in, in that yep. sense. Um, but I love that. I love the fact that uh, the, the relationship between reason and faith, you know, and, and I know we are kind of stepping into uh, one of those territories that, you know, it, it, it's already co complex enough in itself, um, even if Dante wants us to do it here with, with this canto. Yep. Well, can I, can I ask you, can I, you mind if I ask you another question? Please, please go ahead. Okay. So I'm just curious if you think this is legit or not. And if, let me just back up and I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version of this, um, this story. So back in the mid eighties, I, um, besides teaching this course, offering this course on Dante, um, I also offered a course on Charles Dickens and uh, we mostly read David Copperfield. And so I liked the fact that the Divine Comedy and David Copperfield shared the same initials. So it was, it was kind of a cool kind of con confluence that's, thing. But that's great I, dots connecting. Yeah, it was kind of neat how that, how that came about. But I was in a used bookstore in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yep. And I was picked up a copy of a book by a man named Bert Hornback, H-O-R-N-B-A-C-K. And the title of the book was The Hero of My Life, Essays on Dickens. And I, it was about 12 bucks. And, you know, I wasn't sure if I wanted to spend 12 bucks on, on this book. And I opened it up and there were a series of epigraphs. And one of the quotations at the beginning of the book was a, an overheard conversation from uh, fourth grade when this, he was in fourth grade. And it went like this. The teacher said to the student, Marsha Massey, you better be good. You're going to die someday. And Marcia says to her, no, I'm not. I'm going to live all my life. <laughs> pretty, good, pretty good response. And then there was a quotation from Dante's Paradiso. Yep. 
and it was John Sinclair's translation, and it said, and it's in line um, uh, line ninety one. It was yeah. I think I think I saw the universal form of that complex because in the telling of it, I feel my joy expand. Mi sento che io godo. Yes. Yeah, and what I was wanted to ask you if you think it is a legitimate reading extension to say that I that it, it has resonated with me to say the following thing and tell me if this sounds like it's you know off track that I think that I have seen the universal form of this complex um because I not it because in the reading of it I feel my joy expand so, so do you think the reading of the story is comparable to Dante's experience in some way of telling the story? So you're saying you as Dan in the reading of this, yes. So yes, yes. and uh, and I love this uh, comparison very much because um, this is exactly how I understand the Tercet. He's saying, I actually, I don't even remember exactly what I've seen. So even if I tried, I couldn't tell you, but there is this deep joy that I'm feeling simply in, in trying to go back with yeah. my memory. And, and because of that, that, that deep joy wouldn't make any sense if it wasn't, the, it wasn't what, I, what I saw. Um, the, the realism of, of this language is incredible. Wow. It, it really sounds like it's actually true. This is, you know, something of an experience that he went through and, and probably at a mystical vision level, it is, right? Yeah, no, that's, and, and again, how things tend to, you know, um, how if you water seeds, I mean, it sounds, you know, going back to the whole, you know, scriptural imagery here, but how often um, book intersection can blossom into an awful lot of loving experiences of grace, mm. right? And so in 1992, excuse me, 1993, I reached out to Professor Hornback because he was teaching Dickens at uh, University of Michigan, but he had left. And I thought he might, I'd have my students read some of his essays and maybe he would talk with us on the phone. And so I found him teaching at a college in Kentucky and called him on a Wednesday night after basketball practice, about 6.30. <laughs> Tracked him you know. down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, Professor Hornbeck, um, my name is Dan Christian. Um, I'm a high school teacher in Baltimore, and I get to teach a, a course on Dante's Divine Comedy, as well as Charles Dickens. And he, there's a pause, and he sort of starts to chuckle, and he said, Mr. Christian, you may not I've never spoken to this man in my life. He said, you may not believe this, but right when you called, I was reading Dante. He said, I have Dante in my lap. <laughs> and I said, well, of course you do. I mean, I would have been disappointed if you didn't. I mean, that's what people do on Wednesday night. <laughs> you know, they read the read Divine Comedy. I said, would you be willing to talk with us? He said, what I'd really rather do, I'd be glad to talk to you, but what I'd really rather do is just come to your school. And I said, well, we're not really prepared to do another, you know, assembly and, you know, to reimburse him and stuff. He said, listen. I haven't been to Baltimore in a long time, and it's only a 10-hour drive. So on uh, October, uh, April 23rd, 1993, he spent the day with our uh, uh, Charles Dickens class. Oh, wow. And he brought a copy of every one of He'd written four books on Dickens. He brought a copy for each of my students in class. It was just like this. It was this unexpected Dante intersection that blossomed into one more sign that generosity it gets the final word in the universe not not hatred it, you know something else that uh, it seems to be dante seems to be referring to in in, in this canto um especially when it, in this verse that you're mentioning the the la forma universal uh, i'm going to the line 91 la forma universal di questo nodo he, I love how he calls it a knot, a knot, right? Yes. Yep. Because here he is going to the concept, he's touching on the concept of uh, unity, of uh, um, everything is scattered in the universe. And uh, in the 
in God, everything comes together in a mysterious way. But uh, I also love the fact that he mentions the Sibyl because the Sibyl um, oracles, if somebody has read, you know, Virgil, etc., she used to give her oracles on these leaves and then kind of scatter them in, in the air and the wind so that, you know, good luck. <laughs> everything was, and, but that kind of scattering, I think he chose it here in, in, the, in the poem to contrast the unity, the unity yeah. of God um, and the fact that everything really converges. Can we find one single point in all this mess that we live? Because our life are a mess. We live messiness every single day. Is there one point, Dante is asking, that where we can make everything converge? And, uh, and, and that's the point that, that is um, um, focusing on. So. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I, is, there, is there a any significance do you think to the because I, I mean, this as you were just uh, you know so, uh, you know reading this that um, in the Italian that the um, the fact that the image he chooses to convey the the unity is that it's like a book it's a volume exactly. Um, Yes, and so there's something about, um, and if I remember right, I mean you would clearly know this that the the Aeneid is referred to as a volume in the poem as well as the Bible. So all yes. three of these volumes, you know, Aeneid, Bible, and the universe itself is one big book. Our challenge is to become better readers. So I love this one. Is line eighty five that you're referring to? Where yeah. the Italian goes, yeah. nel suo profondo vivi, vidi che s'interna, legato con amore in un volume, ciò che per l'universo si squaderna. And this verb squaderna is very, very specific and uncommon, but it, the quaderno was, and still is today in Italian, um, a book, um, like, a, like a notebook, it's a notebook, and squaderna especially thinking about how the notebooks and books were in his times, um, was when all the, the sheets of paper would come undone. And so they would just scatter around because maybe the glue was not uh, keeping it together. That's the technical meaning of squaderna, you know? Wow. Um, and obviously we, wow. we love the fact that Dante thinks about a volume of book because he, he was the, the bookish person, um, one of the most bookish. I mean, he knows everything that's been written until his time. And uh, let's let's keep in mind, you know, he didn't have everything in, in front of him because he, he kept traveling. He was from one court to the other. So mm -hmm. there must have been a lot in his kind of computer, in his mental, <laughs> mental microchip or something. Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for for highlighting that beautiful tercet. Um, I wanted to try and also clarify the second request before we kind of say goodbye to Saint Bernard. The second request of Saint Bernard to Mary is at line thirty four because the first one is clear. He asks Mary, "Please allow this man to to have this mystical vision." Mm -hmm. The second request at line thirty four is "Ancor ti prego." che poi ciò che tu vuoli, che conservi sani dopo tanto vedere gli affetti suoi, eh, so that uh, after this vision, his sentiments preserve their perseverance. It's a, I like the translation, but I'm thinking about the literal Italian translation, which would mean um, his affections. Uh, and so what he's saying is that he hopes that after this vision has happened, he hopes that in the rest of his life that he has to live until his death, his heart remains pure. Yes, yeah, well said. You know, it's, it's simple, but it makes sense that somebody in, in that situation is wishing for that because you've done so much spiritual work. This is a spiritual direction, this, this poem, on yourself, and you don't want to you know, ruin it for, for some, uh, something that happens because you can, you can always ruin it. We have our free will until the last moment of our breathing life, right? 
And so we can always do something that is wrong and it goes against the, um, the direction that we would like to, to keep. So it's a very, it's a very moving wish. I think it's a very moving desire that, that he has here. No, that's 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 wonderfully said. And he even at the end, you know, even you know, we talk about you know the story taking place in the afterlife. The last thing that he has after this flash of light, his will and his desire become one. Oh yes, right. I mean, so his he still ha even after even in heaven, people have free will. It's just, I guess, that their free will and their desire to be one with God have been together. Well, you know, um, Christianity and Catholicism, I think in particular, get a, a bad rap for all the, um, what sounds like, uh, you know, demands on your desires. Yes, and, well said. And, and, and this is the point. The point is not... To, to be punitive and to tell you not to do this, not to do that. The point is to try and align, align your desire with what a, a lot of generations of people before you, including sometimes your parents, have recognized as the good. What, what is the good? If you can align that, your own feelings and desires to what is good, you're done. <laughs> you're, you're good, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's just not very easy. Um, and that he even says in line the I can find it, line 100 um, whoever sees that light is soon made such that it would be impossible for him to set that light aside for uh, enough, for other sight because the good the object of the will is fully gathered in that light precisely so il ben che nel voler obietto the goal of our of our life is the good. The is the good the, the goal of our will is to desire the good. I mean, awesome. you know what? We, we can talk about it, we can say this out loud, but then we have our life to live, no? And we all know that it's not easy because we have so many pools. We get pulled everywhere um, by temptations, uh, disorder, destructions, and things. And, and, and we don't realize it, not recognizing it uh, is, is, I think, dangerous, not, not recognizing that, that type of uh, dynamic. It's a very human dynamic. You know, my, my other uh, point when I finished the, the entire Commedia and I look back is what a humanism, you know, what a reflection on the human being. Mm -hmm. You are very free at this point to forget all about religion and just look at man, at a human being and say, wow, this guy knew psychology. He, he, he could really look in the bottom of all of our souls. Um, how did he do that? I don't know. That's how great writers uh, do it. You know, um, it's a, a gift from God. Very, very well, yeah, very well said. I mean, he, um, he, he had his, uh, um, and we are talking today and as readers, we are the amazingly fortunate beneficiaries of his gift. Uh, yes, yes, it, it really is a, it really is a gift. It's a, it's a gift uh, to the world. His life was a very difficult life to live. Um, he suffered for most of it, you know, his, his health was not good, yeah. but then, but then let, let's remember other people. Like this is the nature of art, isn't it? Dostoevsky, who also, by the way, had epilepsy. Um, it's, it seems to be, it seems to me like God creates some people almost to be like radios. They are radios on this earth to communicate the divine will in a, nice, yes. in a clearer way than others than other people and uh, and we, we better listen <laughs> yeah so so we we have to then be better the better we better hopefully the more we read pay attention to be present to all kinds of different kind of art we we tune in to that radio exactly, exactly. i 
honestly don't believe you can read the entire com comedy and come out and say, meh, you know, <laughs> I, well, this is, this is my honest, honest belief. It doesn't matter what kind of walk of life you have. I, how is it possible that you read Infernal Purgatorio and Paradiso and you finish it and you say, yeah, it didn't really do much, you know? <laughs> That's a that's a great that's a great example. I don't know if I remember. I had a colleague back at school tell me one time that one of the things about Brandenburg Brandenburg Concerto is that just listening to Brandenburg Concerto by definition you're going to become a better human being. <laughs> um, I love that yeah. definition. Yes. So yeah, that's yeah. How can you just yeah? Yes, there wasn't much. Fourteen thousand two hundred thirty-three lines of drivel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just doesn't doesn't ring true. I hear you so um so we get to you know we, we get to the moment when uh, saint bernard uh, finishes his uh, uh, intercession prayer he says okay that's uh, the end of it i've said my bit and now it's between you and god basically yep. um so we are dante repeats at least five times the fact that he cannot put it in words okay we understand but but i but i also love it because think about somebody who is very agitated and anxious because he just had um he just was part of an accident for example or maybe he was part of something that you know really shocked him and he's trying to repeat it to us and let's say we are the policemen who are trying to he will keep repeating something about the fact that it's difficult to describe right. That's no? correct. That's correct. It's, it's a very natural, spontaneous thing to to say, and this adds to the realism. As I was saying before, I read this, and it's really like reading some somebody who actually had this experience, as um, supernatural as it sounds. And uh, so we get to exactly line fifty-five. I think we can almost draw a line between Canto. In Canto 33, between the you know before line 55 and after line 55. Okay, yeah. So we can maybe call it the second part, because even Dante says da quinci innanzi, which means from here onward. Right, right. In, in his very structured head, he's saying, okay, I finished one part and I'm starting another one. He also mentions the expressions of a baby, which is fantastic because mm -hmm. this is in fact the third time. Uh, that he mentions a baby, uh, Fantine, which is line, um, it's line 106. Yes, yep. Uh, più quel ricordo che di un fante che bagna ancora la lingua alla mammella. It's the third time that Dante mentions a child, a baby, uh, within the last uh, four cantos. So, yes. from the, yep. you know, the, the Imperium, let's say, narrative part, he's talked about uh, babies and comparing his own expression abilities to babies three times. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, because it's, he can't, because it's impossible. But, uh, but he is one, you know, while most people and most poets said, yeah, it's impossible, so we're not gonna do it. He had the ambition to say, it's impossible, but I, I'm gonna try it. <laughs> and, I'm gonna try and, it anyway, yeah. I'm gonna try anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> and in fact, what is there, if we were to summarize this second part of the canto, what is there to say is uh, Dante's visual depiction and representations of the main Christian mysteries, the, especially the Incarnation and the Trinity, uh, in a way that uh, was maybe foreshadowed by other theologians like St. Bernard, like others, but never with such visual imagination and, cl and clarity, no? For example, this image of the three circles that have three different colors, like, yep. and two of them, God and Christ, um, are like rainbows reflecting each other. And then there is a, the third one, that's the Holy Spirit, which is the fire uniting God and Christ. I'm not going to even try to get into conversations about the, the mystery of the trinity but that's what dante is trying to do he's trying to express a very very complex theological concept 
And then the incarnation may be the even more important mystery of Christianity, because if an alien came to earth today and asked me, you know, you are the one who's going to explain to me in one sentence what your religion is about. What's your religion? And I think I have to say, I have to mention incarnation. I have to say Christianity is about God becoming man, becoming one of us. The point of it starts from the, the source and the origins comes from there. Um, and hopefully the, the alien will understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so what, what do you think, Tom, would there be, so as Dante gets to the, um, you know, really gets to the ending and he's talking about these three circles uh, of different colors and, um, and then is, is mystified and then comes to an understanding of how our effigy is present in the second circle, right? If you or me or somebody else, that, that when you have this, you know, maybe in a moment of prayer or in a moment of something that sort of is trans-rational or super-rational for you, can you think of, that's Dante's image to describe the mystery of the Trinity. Can you think of an image that would be, and it's a pretty good one, it seems to me, it's pretty strong. Um, can you think of, again, I'm not trying to quiz you here, I'm just curious, do you think that for people that are take their own journeys, that I or you or anybody else might have or might need a metaphor or an analogy to describe our experience of the fullness of being. Can you think of another metaphor off the top of your uh, off the top of your head that would be um, that might be meaningful so besides the three circles? <laughs> so first of all, let me let me say that I feel how much fun. It, it must have been to be in a class with you as a teacher, okay? Because, <laughs> because you really you really pull things together in, in a, such an engaging way. Um, but you know, that's a skill as well. And um, um, you know what I'm thinking? What your question makes me think um, without uh, daring to come up with my own image, <laughs> uh, I'm going to use a metaphor. Actually, this is quite interesting. For anybody who knows the Sistine Chapel, or maybe anybody who's visited the Sistine Chapel, um, Michelangelo was another genius of our Italian history and cultural tradition. And uh, when, uh, when he came to depicting God, especially in the, in the fresco of the creation, he did something very sneaky because he was not supposed to, but uh, all the um, vestments and the, the clothing that is surrounding God, in you know, this God with the hand and Adam, but all, all the, you know, the clothing that is surrounding God are uh, forming a shape that everybody today agrees um, Michelangelo drew in the shape of a brain, of, a, of the section of a brain. Wow, I did not, that's pretty cool. So that, to me, has always recalled this effigy of human of the human being that Dante sees in the circles because huh. hey huh. it's us you know it's about us and yes God is in the highest point that you can imagine and beyond it but he's also in the deepest point that we can imagine of ourselves yes. Yes. and and deeper so yes we are also talking about the deepest point inside our brain and Michelangelo was onto something when he did that. Wow. Uh, I'm going to show it, you know, in our video, because I remember when I, when somebody explained it to me, like a, an, a professor of art, and you see a section of the anatomy of the brain and the nervous system, and then you see what Michelangelo drew around God. It's undeniable, undeniable. So I mean, that, that, that's just, um, um, I mean, that's just pretty incredible. I mean, I don't have any, I don't have any words. I can't remember where I had, had read this, but that there was um, some theological narrative tradition 
that I don't know where it came from, but was 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 arguing or suggesting that Jesus is um, um, the creation of Jesus is, is sort of beyond the Bible, you know, Luke and Matthew kind of thing, is that Jesus came, um, was born out of God's ear. And the, the whole idea that the relationship between the incarnation and God's divine mind were sort of one and the same. Um, and, and it made me wonder if that, that, and I guess it's just in English, I don't know how this is in Italian, the whole idea of the immaculate conception, you know, when we think about that word conception, it has to do with the, the way we think. Huh. Wow. That's another very interesting connection that you're making there. The, the, the term itself, conception, and yeah. uh, the, the way we, we think we generate life, we generate thought words um uh, another one of those topics then that uh, i'm gonna leave to theologians because you know yeah, me too that's right that's right uh, i'm just trying to <laughs> touch but but um uh, you know this is exactly like you said at the very beginning of this video i hope and i think that dante would be pretty happy to to hear this type of conversation uh spurred by by his work um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure, Tom, that in relationship to this program that you've so lovingly and generously created, that, that Beatrice, Bernard, and all those saints are putting their hands together and pleading to the divine presence. Notice that this guy did a really good thing for everybody. <laughs> I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, so, okay, here comes a question for you, Dan. Dan. I'm, um, um, I'm wondering for you, but also for your students. We get to the end of this uh, unbelievable work of literature and we get to the question, so what? You know, so what? Not now what? Do we put it away and uh, move on? And we think, oh, you know what? I've seen something beautiful. I'm gonna move on to the next beautiful thing and then to the next beautiful thing. Um, so what? Is there a... Uh, a, a right and wrong way to use the divine comedy in our life uh, or maybe have you seen your students react in different ways somebody maybe a little bit colder somebody a little bit wa warmer you know that that's a i mean that what a wonderful question that's another one of those um you know it's hard for me to to speak necessarily because i certainly had lots of students i remember one boy that um I had referenced, I think, in our first conversation, but in one of his other letters, when he took a Princeton a course at Princeton, Professor Robert Hollander, he said something in his letter that he's not a religious person, but what he's come to realize that just thinking about reading and talking about Dante's Divine Comedy just makes him happy. And um, so the so what question, which is, you know, that's a that's like the key question. You know, lots of times people can use that sarcastically, right? Ah, so what? And that's clearly not what you mean. It's certainly not what I mean. It's like, okay, now what? Yeah, now what? <laughs> and I don't know what the, I can only, I think as a reader, certainly for me, and I was thinking about this as I was thinking about getting this chance to talk with you again and, you know, trying to try here that whatever it is that Dante experienced in Canto 33, Whatever it is he's struggling through words to bear witness to, I want more of it. I want to participate in the, the, that good so, to whatever degree that I can. Let me interrupt you there because um, I'm loving what you said so much. In, uh, in speaking with the Catholic friends of mine, this specific point has come up recently, especially when it comes to uh, conversion. In other words, it's pretty uh, commonsensical that something you, you hear and you say that you don't argue somebody into conversion. You don't argue somebody into becoming faithful, religious. That does not happen. It, it might happen, okay, in some cases, but you have to be starting from a very, very poor um, cultural level if, if that happens it generally doesn't because you have made up your mind 
from a logical or rational point of view. What does happen very often is precisely what you said, which is the desire when you see a specific type of profound joy in somebody is it i want that i want that thing for for me in my life you know i love it i love the way it looks it's beautiful and i, I would like to have it for myself um that generally speaking is is the um, more common way that somebody will uh, talk to you about their own conversion or, or reconversion yeah. interesting um yeah. i certainly want whatever he would he had his eye on whatever it is, and I, you know, I don't know if about want it. I want to participate in that love that moves the sun and the other stars. You know, I, I mean, I want more of that in my life, and um, and you know, getting a chance to talk about Dante uh, certainly with you, and certainly having been hanging out with it and just reading it on my own um, is an it's an invitation to participate in that love. Yeah, if if. Um... If I had to maybe, if we can say that, you know, wrap it up from my end, which I never wrap it up, you know, as soon as I'm finished, I'm going to start again with Inferno 1 <laughs> and then again and then again. But, um, yep. you know, just for the sake of, of this series and this, and this conversation, um, I love how open you are to the, the you know, to the entire conversation, the, the religious and the non-religious one. From, uh, from my end, I understand, I try to understand that Dante is uh, not only being our spiritual guide, he's also trying to infuse new energy in the people who are already Christian. He's not out to convert people to Christianity, especially given his times. He is speaking to Christians and he's saying, actually, there are much better ways to do what you're doing and to go, you know, about life um, than, than what you're doing. Um, without saying, I do it better. He's just pointing, he's just pointing direction. It's, it's a matter of almost understanding. So to me, it all goes back to the divinization of the human being. And that's where Christianity finds its, its original point in the incarnation. The fact that, uh, if God became man, I, my, the goal of my life is not only to be a good person, a nice person, a good person. The goal of my life is not only to be successful in what I try to do, because I think it's good, material success, any kind of success. And the goal of my life is not, you know, just to help other people. The main goal of my life is to participate in something where God is. And, and I, you used the expression before, you said to, partic to, to be part of something. And uh, it's a pretty high goal, um, difficult goal, but striving towards it allows me to become the, the best possible version of myself. And the best possible version of myself is not because I am me, but it's because I am a human being. And, yep. and all of us can, can do that. Very, very well, very well, very well wrapped up. Um, <laughs> even though wrapping up isn't the uh, yeah, because you're going to start. You're going to start again. You know, when we hang up uh, tomorrow, and and the journey begins, but it's a little bit brighter and a little bit um, tastier because we've gotten to 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 talk Dante. I mean, and certainly, certainly for me, it's it's, it's these conversations and. There's been some other examples in my life where, you know, I, um, it's almost as if the God or the universe or however you sort of identify it is saying, hey, listen, how many more signs do you need before I, before you come to really realize that I'm on your side? Huh. My, and this, this has been one of those signs for me. So thank you. Uh, it, it's such a huge pleasure. My, um, uh, you make me. You're making me think about uh, um, a pastor, a priest who, who used to tell me, you know, the it doesn't matter what you're doing. God is always at work, but this work is never um, rushed. It's always kind of patient and 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 gentle. Um, I don't know what this exactly means, to be honest, Dan. 
but but I know that it's true. I know that it's true. So that's my part of my witness. Well, uh, the, uh, I appreciate and you know uh, be, not be as again you being a Catholic Christian and my being not be not. I think what we've learned in some sense is that we're still trying to look together in the same direction. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Well, thank you. And uh, Thank you, thanks Tom, for very much. Uh, yes, all, all your work. Uh, uh, and thanks to everybody who's been, uh, who has had the patience to listen to this heavily Italian accented uh, series <laughs> it's, it's for, really... uh, for 100 videos. It's been such a pleasure to all the comments, all the interaction with the people who have been uh, watching and listening. Oh my God, such a blessing, such a blessing. Well, congratulations again on, on very, um, I think the Bible says, uh, and you'll be uh, maybe one of the first in line. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Appreciate so, it. All right, Tom. Thanks so much, Dan. And thank, thank you, everybody. You. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.